Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Get Me Ready to Buy podcast. This is the podcast where we help people just like you get ready to buy their home. We talk about things like partner with a professional, plan the money, pick your place, persevere through clothes, possess your property or your home, and protect your home. And today we're going to be in that space between pick your place and persevere through clothes because it's all about making the offer. Let's dive right in. Buying a home is exciting, but the process can be overwhelming. Trying to understand all of the paperwork, financing, and what you need to do can be stressful. Without knowing what you're doing or where things stand, it's hard to move forward. Or worse, you can make a mistake that costs you thousands of dollars. That's where the Get Me Ready to Buy podcast, hosted by Jeff Jones, comes in. Jeff is a realtor, coach, and entrepreneur. He helps take the guesswork out of home buying by providing you with the details, resources, and professionals that make the process easier to understand so you can successfully buy your next home with confidence. Now here's Jeff. So you found a place. It's time for you to make the offer on that property. And you want the seller to accept it and to send it back signed without making any changes to it. What are some things you need to be prepared for in making that offer? Well, let me tell you what I do from the perspective of helping a seller buy what sell their home to make sure that the offer that you send fits what that seller is looking for. The first thing you need to make sure is that your offer is complete, whether you're doing this on your own or you have an agent working with you. You're going to have to sign that. You're trusting that agent who represents you to actually get everything filled out on the form, on the offer that you're going to be making. But if some things are left off, that seller's agent may send it back and say, this isn't complete. That might allow time for another buyer to get an offer in and they get it accepted before you do. So make sure it's complete. Now, most of us agents use kind of boilerplate forms. I know in the two states where I'm an agent, our state uh, realtor association provides forms that have been created by lawyers. And all we have to do is fill in some blanks. We have to fill in the blanks of, you know, who's the seller, who's the buyer, how much, what's the exact property address, what's their legal description, the tax parcel ID number, all kinds of things that we need to fill out. First thing you need to make sure is it's complete. You didn't leave anything out. There may be, there may be some places that you know, you might could write in none or NA for not applicable. Uh, it might be okay to leave those blank. But many times I get uh, an offer from a buyer's agent and our contracts are supposed to include uh, the actual agents, the listing agent and the sellers, the buyer, the buyer's agent, their license numbers on the forms. It also is supposed to include the listing brokerage license number and the buyer's brokerage license number. About half the time I get an offer and it doesn't have some of some or one of those license numbers. Usually the, the buyer's agent knows their license, knows their broker's license number and can find my license number. Many times they don't take the effort to go and find my broker's license number if I haven't given it to them in the listing information. I try to give it to them in the listing information but I go the extra mile and look up the office that that agent's in and find who that managing broker is or that license number for that brokerage. That information may not be available in some MLSs, but I kind of doubt that. Anyway, you need to make sure it's complete, that it's all filled out so that nobody can add anything to it, change anything in there. And when you sign it, that you're signing something that's complete. Now, the second thing I do once I've scanned it to see, did they leave any holes anywhere that we need to send it back? Then I began looking to see, is it correct? Now, there are some things that could be mistakes on here. Uh, do you really know who the seller is? Did the listing agent put that information so that you can find that? Did you check the tax records? Are the tax records correct? Did someone pass away? Uh, somebody else get it? It's not changed uh, in the, in the county records, it's not indicated who the new owner is, uh, but you want to make sure that you have the parties in there as best as you can. 
Uh, you also want to make sure that the all the information about the property is correct. The tax ID number. Uh, there was a property that I was helping uh, a family buy and the um, the property, the house was actually straddling two different pieces of property with two different tax ID numbers. We had to make sure that we were making the purchase of the address that we included both parcel ID numbers so that both num both parcels changed properties. It wouldn't do them any good to own one parcel with part of the house and not own the other parcel, other piece of property with that had the rest of the house on it. So we had to make sure that was on there. So you have to make sure that the property information is correct, that it's listed on there. You also want to make sure that the brokerage information is correct, that all of the times are correct as far as the deadline, when you plan to close by, the purchase price, uh, earnest money, all the blanks that are filled in. Once it's complete, once you know it's complete, you need to make sure that they're correct. And then once I know that it's complete, that the information is correct, and especially from a buyer, you don't want to be making an offer on a house that was $300,000 and an extra zero got put in. And so you're spending $3 million on a $300,000 house. Need to make sure it's correct. And even though that agent's representing you, we are human. We make mistakes. We fingers hit the wrong buttons on keyboards when we're filling things in. We might skip over a checkbox that needed to be checked or an amount or something in there. So while we are doing our best to represent you, and that's what our job is. We do make mistakes from time to time. Uh, things get left off. And it's so it's also your responsibility to make sure before you sign anything that it represents what you agree to. You may not read all of the fine print in the contract. I would encourage you to. Uh, your agent, I, as me as an agent, I'm not a lawyer. I can do my best to explain that stuff to you. But all of the parts of the contract that have been typed in already have all been created by a lawyer and they're designed to represent the person who is submitting the offer or submitting the form, whether it's a listing agreement, a buyer's agency agreement, an uh, offer to purchase property, whatever it is. But all that stuff has been done by a lawyer. You can have a conversation with a lawyer if you're not fully aware, uh, fully understand what all's in there, but especially where the blanks get filled in, you're trusting your agent and you need to make sure that your agent got it right. Now, once you're going to be sending in an offer, or once I get an offer for a piece of property that I represent the seller, I'm going to be looking at now, I'm going to look at the content. Was it complete? Was the information correct as far as about the property and the parties involved? And then the content, what's the price? What price are you offering for the house? Are you offering the list price? Are you offering less for various reasons? Or are you offering more because you really want the property? You know that there are probably going to be a lot of people who are interested in it. So you're offering some more. But you get to decide on the price that you offer. As your agent, if I were your agent, my loyalty is to you and I have to obey any instructions you give me even if I think they're ridiculous, as long as they're lawful. If this house is listed at $300,000 and you tell me you want to make an offer of $180,000, I'll try to talk you out of it. But at the end of the day, I have to be obedient to your instructions. That was not a lawful instruction. I think it was a ridiculous instruction. You don't offer that unless the roof has just fallen in and then they wouldn't be listing it for $300,000. About $300,000. Anyway, offer a good price when you're making an offer to a property. It may be less, it may be more, it may be the same, but offer a good price. Then earnest money is going to be one of those things that you need to make sure that you have taken into account when you're planning the money. Earnest money is kind of like uh, an engagement ring. Of course, this is a wedding ring. It's kind of like an engagement ring. It says, I'm serious. <laughs> I really want you in my life. Uh, so when you're giving earnest money to a house for a house and with an offer, uh, that money is toward the purchase price. It's not extra. It's toward the purchase price. But you're giving that money up front to show that you're serious about 
this particular piece of property. You want this property to be yours. You're giving that earnest money. And sometimes a seller will indicate an amount of earnest money. Uh, other times it's up to you, the buyer, to decide how much are your earnest money is that going to be. I've seen earnest money as little as $500 and I've seen earnest money as much as $10,000. It just depends on you and depends on the property. Typically the lower priced properties, it's lower amounts of earnest money. When you get into the luxury type homes, it's more earnest money. Uh, it just depends on you. The earnest money stays with the property. And if you close on it, it shows back up at closing as part of your purchase price, part of your down payment that you're pre putting that down payment down. Uh, it shows back up. If you terminate the listing, the purchase price, if you I mean the purchase agreement, if you terminate because of some issue with the home or some issue with your loan, make sure that your contract that you submitted to purchase the property gets you that money back. Because if you walk away for cause, you need to be able to get that money back. If you walk away because you found a house two blocks over that you'd rather have, and you just want to forget this house, you've got some negotiating to do with the seller to get the earnest money back, but they have a right to keep it. You just need to know that going into it, which is why it's, I really want this property here. Let me give you some money that shows you how serious I am. The earnest money is either going to be held by your broker, the, your buyer's broker, or it's going to be held by the listing brokerage, or it could be held by a third party, an attorney, a lawyer. If you're buying a, a brand new house, typically in my market, the seller holds the earnest money. It's a builder. Uh, he holds the earnest or he, she, that entity holds the earnest money, but that's, uh, you can put in the offer who you want to hold the earnest money. Uh, many times when I have a listing, I've said who holds the earnest money. So they know coming in, making an offer who we want to hold the earnest money, who the seller wants to hold the earnest money. However, that buyer can write in their contract. If you want your brokerage to hold it and the listing has said they want the listing brokerage to hold it, you can write in there that here's a thousand dollars of earnest money but we want the seller's brokerage to hold it or the buyer's brokerage to hold it. The seller accepts that's who holds the earnest money stuff that's written in descriptions and information in the multi-listing service. The MLS isn't law. Uh, it's the best that we know of information about the house, but you can't hold somebody to what's listed in there. Uh, they just made a mistake on putting something in there or something changed. But anyway, for as far as earnest money goes, you can either let whoever the seller says they want to hold the earnest money if they've indicated, or you get to choose and you can write that in your offer. Then there are going to be some contingencies in the offer. And we talk about contingencies. Those are always things that if they were to come to pass in a negative way or not come to pass, you would want to walk away from the property. The very first contingency we think about is inspections. You have a right, if you choose in the offer, to have the property professionally inspected by a variety of different inspectors. Typically, we talk about a home inspector. There can also be structural or engineer, HVAC inspections, uh, plumbing inspections, whatever it could be. But you have so many days and a right to get that property inspected so that you know that this is a good deal. And sorry about that ding. I'm going to turn my speakers on my computer down. I'm recording this in the morning and my wife just sent me a text that said, I'm eating a bowl of cereal. Uh, I'll eat something a little bit later. Anyway, you're going to want to get it and probably get an inspection on the property. Then you have so many days to get the inspection. After that, you have so many days to negotiate if there's going to be any changes to uh, any repairs, the sales price, you want to walk away from it, all those things. But those are contingencies. Once you pass that and you're satisfied, either they've agreed to repairs or a, a change in price or everything was good, then you're able to continue moving forward and you're going to be uh, getting an appraisal more than likely. Uh, you can waive the appraisal, although I don't recommend it in a really hot market with bunches of multiple offers. Sometimes that's a strategy that you use 
Um, I recently did that and we were fortunate that the uh, property came back and appraised for $2,000 more than what we were offering on the property. It's always uh, risky. It's just how bad do you want the property? If you're going to waive the appraisal, have a conversation with your lender, have a conversation with your agent and make sure that you know this is what you want to do. It's I consider it kind of a last resort thing. So just be aware of that. Hey, thank you for hanging with the Get Me Ready to Buy podcast so far. You need to know how ready you are to buy a home. So get your score at readytobuyscore.com. You'll pick a few statements, get an email telling you what your score is and what you need to focus on to get ready to buy a home. If I can help you in my market, which is the Mid-South, the Memphis metro area, please let me know. If you're in another market, I've got agents all over the country and in a few countries around the world. Reach out to me and I'll connect you with one of our agents who can help you get your home bought wherever you are. Now, back to the show. But your lender, if you're borrowing money to purchase the property, the lender is going to want to make sure that your property is worth at at least... um, you know, what they're offering you, what they're going to loan you. If they're loaning you $300,000, they're going to consider that to be anywhere from 80% to 97%, possibly a hundred percent, depending on the type of loan of what, what your home is, what the home is valued at. That's the amount they're going to be loaning you. They don't want to loan you $300,000 on a house that comes back and appraised for $280,000. Uh, That's not good business for you. It's not good business for them because if you defaulted, they're losing a bunch of money and they, the banks don't want to lose money. So you're going to get an appraisal, something you're going to pay for. And and I should have said earlier, you're going to be paying for the inspection as well. Uh, You may not pay for the appraisal until closing. Uh, Some law, some lenders route roll those into your closing monies and some lenders uh, get a check from you ahead of time. They may hold it or they may cash it, but they may have you pay for it ahead of time because they don't want to be out the money if you decide to walk away. It's just an expense that you're going to have. Uh, then you're also going to be so that it, that appraisal comes back. And if it's good, you move forward. If it's not, there may be some negotiating with the seller on what to do next. Then you're also going to be having a loan and that loan is going to go through underwriting where they're going to say that they're going to support the loan. They're going to support this purchase of this property based on all of your personal information as far as credit, job, money, all those things about you that they're looking at. They're also going to be looking at the house that's going to talk. They're going to be talking about insurance and the roof, uh, the the condition of the home. All of those things go into play of whether or not you're able to get a loan. And your your lender may come back to you and say, hey, uh, Mr. Buyer, Ms. Buyer, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to provide a loan uh, for this house for this reason. And it could be a variety of reasons. If that's the case and you walk away from the deal and you could go try to find another lender and, and that may work. But if you decide to walk away, you should get your earnest money back because you weren't able to get your loan. That's a contingency. It's in there, uh, at least in the offers I make, I make sure that we check that, that it's based on you being able to get the funding for it. And if you can't, you get to back out of the deal. There's going to be some other things in the in the content that are possible contingencies, um, probably not really contingencies here, but that's well, one of the contingencies is going to be selling a home. Uh, I have a property under contract right now that we've extended a couple of times because the buyer really wants it. We would like the buyer to have it. Uh, we've not really had any other interest in it. So it's to my seller's benefit to keep it under contract and maybe to help this buyer of theirs get their home sold. But there's a contingency that they're not going to be able to buy this property that I'm, I have listed if they can't get their home sold. So there is a right of first refusal that Liz says we can keep marketing the property because it's under a contingency to sell their home. We can keep marketing the property, bringing other buyers in, and we can even entertain other offers. And if we get one we like, we get to go back to the buyer and say, hey, we have an offer that we want to accept. You have 48 hours to prove that you're going to be able to purchase this property or terminate the agreement so we can accept this agreement over here. You might find yourself in one of those. You might even be one of those that you have a house to sell before you can buy a home. Just make sure you have protected yourself, that your your agent who's working for you has protected you and included all that in there. Some other items in the the content are going to be seller concessions. What What is the seller 
going to be offering to you, the buyer? Are you asking them for uh, some specific repairs? Are you asking them for a flooring allowance? It's maybe not a repair, but it, they're kind of damaged. The lender's maybe not going to make them do it, but you would like it done. Are you asking for that? Are you asking for help with some of the closing costs? What is it you're asking the seller to concede to you from their purchase uh, money that they get from the money they get at the closing table? What is it you're asking them to concede back to you? It may be none. It may be some. It just depends on your needs. It may depend on your current market, but that's where you need to listen to that professional agent, give you some guidance. There was a period back in uh, 2021 and early 2022 that, you know, I was telling buyers, you don't need to ask for anything. Uh, we're, we're making an offer. We're one of 10 offers. And do you think that they're going to entertain your offer? If you're asking for a home warranty, you're asking for $5,000 in uh, closing costs or down payment for you, for them to give it back to you or some housing allowance or whatever it is. Do you think they're going to do that? Because they're probably going to get multiple offers that aren't asking for anything. In some markets, when houses aren't selling, they're kind of slow right now. You might ask for some things. Uh, but that's where you need to listen to that professional who has the, they understand the pulse of the current market that you're in, your local current market. They understand that. Listen to your professional agent who's working for you to help you navigate what specific things need to be in the content of the offer so that you're making an offer that the seller is going to want to say, yes, this is the one. Let's do this. That's what you want. Other content is going to be deadline. Now you're going to give the seller a deadline of when they can accept your offer. If they haven't accepted it by then you're done. You've moved on somewhere else. That deadline only protects you because if a seller isn't able to make a decision by then for a variety of reasons, they're looking at other offers, whatever else, but let's say that you submit an offer and it terminates at 6 PM tomorrow night. 6 p.m. tomorrow night rolls around. You haven't heard anything. They haven't rejected it. They haven't accepted it. They haven't countered the offer. You haven't heard anything. 10 o'clock the following morning, your agent calls you and says, hey, uh, they accepted our offer early this morning. What do you want to do? Now, the deadline is over. You are not bound to accept the fact that they signed an offer and it's accepted and you signed it and they signed it. They signed it after the deadline that offer expired. You can either say, sure, I want the house, which more than likely you will. Or you can say, you know what? Seven o'clock last night, you know, we found that house that, that we were looking at because they, they weren't, you know, they hadn't gotten back with us on this house. I think that house is really the house for us. It's $10,000 less. Uh, it's a little bit closer to work, whatever it may be. And so you can say, hey, sorry, they, they missed the deadline. It, it's over and it's it's done. It's it's no longer a, an offer. However, you could say, yes, we've been looking forever. We cannot find a home like this one. Yes, we want this house. I don't care that they signed after the deadline. I want the property. You can do that, too. So your agent can call them back and say, hey, it's after the deadline. However, they're accepting this and we're moving forward. Yay, the seller's getting their house sold, and yay, you're getting the house that you want. Some more content that's going to be here is the close date. When do you plan to close? Meaning you're going to have all of your stuff ready. You're going to have the money ready to pay for it. When does the seller need to be out of the house, unless they already are out, or you extend it for them to stay in there? When are you going to be, when are you going to be getting the house? And that's the closing date. I typically pick a date that's 30 to 45 days out because it takes the lender the underwriting time to go through all the paperwork and stuff about you looking at the property to get the inspections, to get the appraisal, all of those things. Um, it can be done faster. Uh, it's difficult to do it much faster than 30 days with a lender just because it takes time. Uh, but I typically do closer to 45. It just depends on if the seller has said, Hey, you know, we would love to be able to close within the next 30 days. Or if my buyer says we have a deadline, I have to be, you know, on the job. We'd love to be in the house. Can we speed things up and move them in there? But you have a, a, a date to close. Now, 
in that persevere through close, any of this content could change. If there's some repairs, you could change the purchase price. You have the potential to negotiate the purchase price. Maybe the lender had some issues getting uh, some paperwork from you or the, uh, the seller's new home is not ready yet. They may come back and say, hey, uh, we can still close on the date that we picked, but is it possible for us to possess the home for two more weeks or can we delay close? It's entirely up to you. All this is going to, has potential has the potential to be renegotiated throughout the process before you actually close on the property. I've got a property closing actually tomorrow uh, when I'm recording this, and this past weekend the sellers came back and said, "Hey, is it any is there any way that we can possess the property um, and give it through the next weekend and give it to you on Monday?" Uh, my buyer said, yes, that's fine. It's taken them a little longer to get packed and moved out and clean and all those things. It's it's an undertaking. If you've not ever moved out of a home, uh, it can be an undertaking. And uh, they just weren't able to get things uh, done in a timely fashion. Now, my buyers could have been under the gun to be in there and said, you know what? Sorry, you just got to figure out whatever it is, because when we close and the deal funds, I'm taking the keys and I'm starting to move in. You need to get your stuff and get gone. My buyers were able to work with them and give them a few extra days. Uh, so that closing date doesn't necessarily mean that's the possession date. That could be later or earlier or when it funds. That's a whole nother little thing. So you've made an offer. We know what all this is. What are the choices that the seller has to make? Or if they present you, well, let's say this. Yeah. What are the choices the seller has to make when you make an offer? The first thing they can do is they can accept the offer. They love it. They're good. Let's do this. They sign it, accept it, send it back to you, and the ball starts moving forward. They can reject it. They can sign it as a rejected offer. They could just let it expire, have their agent let your agent know, or not even do anything. Just, just let it expire. Or they can send you a counter offer. Uh, they can counter offer your purchase price, your earnest money, the deadline to the, the close date, um, any, uh, any concessions you may have asked for. They can come back and counter any of the specific information about that purchase that's in there uh, that's specific to you. They can come back and counter any of that information. Then you have an option to either accept it and say, yeah, we can live with the changes a seller wants to make or reject it and say, no, we're not, we're not doing that. Or you can send them a counter offer back. Let's say that the house was listed for 350 and you made an offer of 320 because the roof is a little bit older. You know, you're going to, have to put a roof on there. So you made an offer of 320. They make a counter offer and they come back a 330 then you can say, yeah, we're good with that. Or you can make another counter offer and go back to 328 or 340 and have them put a roof on, what, whatever. Uh, but you have an option then to, to counter their counter offer if they don't accept it or reject the very first offer that you send. You have that option. This can be complicated. That's why you need to partner with a professional to help guide you through this process instead of trying to figure it out on your own. And if you don't have a local real estate agent in your market who can help you, reach out to me and I'll find you an agent in your market. Now, some more information you're going to need on there. Some contracts have this information on there and some don't. Well, one of the states I'm in, this information is put on the purchase agreement. Uh, another state that I'm in, it's not put on there. And that's who is the closer, uh, who's who's actually going to be the, the closing attorney handling all the paperwork uh, that needs to be communicated. And your lender needs to be communicated uh, with, both of them need to be communicated with. Your seller probably doesn't need so much uh, from them as you do. But once all the documents are signed and you have a property under contract, your closer needs to get copies of that so they can get started and your lender needs to get copies of that so they can crank up the underwriting process so they can get you in the home that you want. Hope this has been helpful to you today. Uh, if you uh, have any questions, you can find me on social media. Uh, send me a text message, send me an email, uh, a direct message, uh, try to give me a call, whatever. I'll do my best to try to answer for you. 
But I hope this has been helpful and that you have great success getting ready and not just getting ready to buy a home, but buying the home that you want so that you can live where you want to live. Have a blessed day. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me today on the Get Me Ready to Buy podcast. Hopefully you found all this information helpful to you and it's made a little more sense out of what it takes to actually buy a home and you feel a little bit more confident about your home buying process. Now, again, as I shared in earlier, if I can help you buy a home in the Mid-South or find you an agent wherever you are, just reach out to me at midsouth.homes or whatever link is here on this podcast or uh, down below in the YouTube channel. If you're listening to this on a podcast, I just mentioned the YouTube channel. There is a Get Me Ready to Buy YouTube channel where you can actually watch the podcast if you'd rather do that. If you're watching this on YouTube and you'd rather listen to it, you can find the link to GetMeReadyToBuy.com and you'll find where you can listen to all the podcasts wherever you get podcasts. I hope that you'll also rate and review the show. There's a link here in the notes, in the show notes or here, where you can review the show and rate it so that others who are looking to buy a home just like you can find it, especially if you found it helpful. And I would love a five-star review if this has been helpful to you. The other thing you can do is remember to get your score at ReadyToBuyScore.com. And as always, hit the subscribe button so that you are the first to find out the latest information about what it takes for you to be ready to buy a home. Have a blessed day.